good morning and welcome to the uh, first of the NVMe presentations today. Uh, this is the computational storage or computational programming. Uh, depends on which language you prefer to use. Uh, we have three of us presenting today. I am Bill Martin from Samsung and I am uh, co-chair of the computational programs task group in NVMe as well as co-chair of the SNEA computational storage uh, technical work group. Uh, with me I also have Kim Malone who is the, a software architect at Intel. Uh, she is also co-chair of the NVMe computational programs task group and she is the editor of both the computational programs I.O. command set and the subsystem local memory uh, I.O. command set. And we'll be talking a lot more about those as that's the full purpose of this talk today is to bring you up to speed on what's going on in those. Um, we also have with us Jason Mulgard. Um, he is a storage controller architect at Solidime, uh, focusing on future controller technologies. He is also co-chair of the SNEA computational storage uh, technical work group and has been a contributor to the uh, NVMe computational programs and subsystem local memory command sets. Um, so with that, let me uh, just get into the uh, agenda for today. Uh, so we'll talk about the major architectural components. Uh, we'll talk about memory namespaces. We'll talk about the new copy command for the memory. Uh, we'll talk about compute namespaces, program unique identifiers, uh, the memory range sets, the computational programs command set, reachability and reachability association and example flow. And with that, I will uh, turn it over to Jason to start off with the major architectural components. All right, thank you, Bill. Good morning, everyone. So uh, as Bill said, uh, my name is Jason Mulgard. So taking a look at the major architectural components, uh, and we've got this block diagram shown over here on the uh, uh, left-hand side of the slide that uh, has a, a number of different uh, namespaces, two of which are new. Uh, on the left, we've got compute namespaces, uh, and in the middle, we have memory namespaces. And over on the right, we have the uh, NVM namespaces that we all know and love, including NVM, zone, key value namespaces. All three of these namespaces play a role in computational storage within NVM Express. So we're going to get a little bit more detail of the new namespaces. Starting with memory namespaces. So what is a memory namespace? So first of all, it is the, the block in the middle outlined in red on that same diagram that we just looked at on the previous slide shown here. So a memory namespace provides host command access to memory in the NVM subsystem. It is associated with the subsystem local memory I.O. command set, and it is used by the computational programs command set to provide access to subsystem local memory for program execution. So what does all that mean? So if we distill that down, essentially it means that we can have volatile memory in an NVM subsystem, and that uh, volatile memory can be accessed by both the host using subsystem local memory commands uh, or by the computational programs. Uh, so as an analogy, you can think of it as a two-port memory where you have one port that is host, that you can access from the host, and the other port is accessible by, uh, by computational programs. And that's an important uh, to keep in mind because it is both sides that have access to this memory. So from the host side, you'd have the subsystem local memory command set for accessing these memory namespaces. And we've defined several new commands uh, to, for that access. We have a, a memory read and a memory write, so the names I, I hope are somewhat intuitive uh, it, and clearly are meant for transferring data between the host and the memory namespace. We also have memory copy, uh, which is a, 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 you know, sort of as the name would suggest, for copying data. In this case, it's for copying data from an NVM namespace to a memory namespace or from a memory namespace to a memory namespace. More on the copy command on the next slide. So I mentioned my analogy about the two-port memory. So keeping that in mind, 
We have host accesses that are D-word addressable and D-word granular. Meanwhile, the compute namespace accesses are byte addressable and byte granular. And so that was a de deliberate decision to, to make those uh, them different, especially for the compute namespace. Programs running on data um, are probably going to execute a, a, on a, you know, a, a byte basis or maybe a, you know, a word basis, and you want to have that flexibility to, to uh, be able to access things uh, in the smallest granular as possible. Meanwhile, from the host, it probably doesn't need to be quite that small. All right, so as promised, more on the copy command. So there is an, a memory copy command that's defined in the subsystem local memory or SLM command set. There is an NVM copy command that's defined in the NVM command set. They're both clearly copy commands, so they're, they're going to copy data, but there are a few differences. Uh, so thinking about the memory copy command, uh, so this copies data from an NVM namespace to a memory namespace or from a memory namespace to a memory namespace. So the key there is the destination is a memory namespace. So when you're doing a copy from an NVM namespace to a memory namespace, you're going from uh, one type of namespace that uses LBAs to another type of namespace that uses uh, D words, as we just uh, described on the previous slide. And so the command is going to require that that it's you know on a granularity of LBA size because the source is is LBAs. It doesn't you can't break up that LBA into something smaller, and the command is going to uh, do a conversion from blocks to bytes. If you're copying from a memory namespace to a memory namespace, so there we're going D word to D word, the the the, the length has to just be D word granular. So comparing that to the uh, NVM copy command that's shown over on the right-hand column, so the, this command is going to copy from a memory namespace to a memory to an NVM namespace, or from an NVM namespace to an NVM namespace. So the difference here is the destination is an NVM namespace. So here, we're, the, since the destination is an LBA-based namespace. The, 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 the total length has to be on a granularity of LBA size for that copy. But when you're copying from a memory namespace to an NVM namespace, the command is going to do the conversion from bytes to blocks. All right, so we talked about the subsystem local memory or the memory namespace, so uh, now let's take a look at the compute namespace, which is on the uh, highlighted in red with the red box on the left-hand side of the same diagram that we've seen um, on the last few slides. So what is a compute namespace? So it is able to execute one or more programs, it is associated with the computational programs I.O. command set, and it contains compute resources. So what does that mean? Basically it means that we can have some type of um, compute capability in our NVM subsystem, you can execute programs on it, and you manage those, the, the, all of that through the uh, computational programs I.O. command set. So the computational programs I.O. command set has several new commands for, uh, for executing and managing these, these programs. So the first one uh, that I'll mention, and, and there's more, but, but uh, for starters, we've got the load program. So in this case, the uh, uh, you know, load program is gonna, as the name would suggest, allow you to load a program into the uh, the, the, the compute namespace so that it can be executed and, and run. This may or may not be required. Some products may have a program preloaded from the factory. In that case, you would not need to load it, but it is a capability that's there for the cases where you do want to load it from the host. Once that program is loaded, you now need to uh, activate that program so it becomes available to execute. So you can uh, uh, use the activate command and, and, the, and the program that has been previously loaded can now, now be used. Any program that you execute is going to require memory, uh, specifically the subsystem local memory that we described. And uh, in that memory, uh, you, you, know, you may want to partition off part of it specific for a program. So you, you, you can create or delete a memory range set. Kim is going to get into a lot more detail on memory range sets here in a moment. But for now, suffice it to say that, that we want to allocate a portion of our subsystem local memory uh, for a particular program. 
And then, of course, we want to be able to execute a program um, by calling an execute command and, and have that program uh, begin execution on, on, you know, within our compute namespace. Of course, the computational programs, uh, IO command set provides mechanisms, log pages, and, and everything needed for program discovery. So you can know what's loaded, what's activated, what is the general state of, of everything that you have available in your compute namespace so you can set up your, your programs or system however is necessary to, to make it operate properly. All right, so with that overview, I'm gonna turn it over to Kim who's gonna get us into the next level of detail. So we've been referring to computational programs a number of times here, so let's talk about what they are. So a computational program is conceptually similar to a software function. It's called with parameters and it runs to completion. Um, programs exist within a compute namespace, so each compute namespace may support a certain set of programs. So within the namespace, uh, you address a particular program using a namespace program index. So an index is kind of like a slot. You have a certain number of slots supported, and if you can look at the little gray box, we have a little toy example where there's four slots, and you can see that two of them have programs in them. So you would refer to the downloaded program there as slot one. So you'd say program index one, and that identifies that particular program. So programs may be identified using a globally unique program identifier, and that identifier may tell you what the functionality of the program is. And we'll talk about the details of that in a bit. So programs operate only on data that is in subsystem local memory or data that is passed within the execute program command, like the parameters, for example. There are two types of programs. Uh, the first type is device-defined, and the second is downloadable. So device-defined programs are ones that are provided by the manufacturer. Um, so they kind of come with the device and they may be loaded on it or provided with it. So an example of that is compression or encryption uh, that the device may provide. The other type is downloadable programs. So a downloadable program is something that uh, is defined by um, the host or the application and may be downloaded onto the device. So devices may or may not support downloadable programs, uh, and that is something you can discover. And the device also may support different types of downloadable programs. So let's say a device may support an eBPF downloadable program, or a different device may support different types of downloadable programs, or not at all. So also the program may be only able to execute on a subset of the resources. Uh, let's say it, there could be a compute namespace that has things implemented in an ASIC. So you wouldn't be able to download a program to something in an ASIC necessarily. Alternately, it could be executed on a CPU core. It could be implemented in other ways uh, with an FPGA. The spec doesn't um, restrict any of that at all. It can be implemented however the vendor chooses. Let's go back and talk about program unique identifiers. So I mentioned that when I was talking about programs. Uh, the idea with this new identifier is it's a value, an eight byte value, that identifies the functionality provided by a particular program. So there's two parts to it that we've divided it up into. There's the IEEE standard part that identifies who is assigning these numbers. And then there's also a UPI part. So the IEEE assigned part, um, we have kind of two main uh, choices there. So one is the NVMe value, and the idea there is these be standardized programs that NVMe determines this is supported, and we've defined it in NVMe. So those ones would use uh, the IEEE standard value that has been assigned to NVMe itself, and NVMe will uh, maintain a registry of these. And that is, a uh, definition of such registry is, is being worked. Alternately, uh, the IDs can be vendor-defined. 
So let's say a particular vendor um, provides a device, they would use their own ID, uh, which could be OUI24, or CID24, or OUI36, whichever they use, they all fit into the space that we've provided. So together, this value is looked at as an 8-byte PUID, and you can query the programs on a device and determine what functionality they provide using this identifier. So that's la now let's talk about memory range sets in more detail. So those were mentioned earlier. So memory range sets are things that exist within a particular compute namespace. Uh, the, memory the memory range sets basically are used for the purpose of limiting program access to a particular subset of SLM. So the idea there is when you do a particular execution of a program, you provide the range set that that program is allowed to access. And the idea there is the device will not allow the program to access memory that is not within those ranges so that the program doesn't go off the rails and start to do things in memory that you don't want it to. Um, this association is per execution, so you could execute the same program again with a different memory range set the next time, which is fine. So unsurprisingly, a memory range set is composed of memory ranges. Each range is identified using a memory namespace ID and offset within that namespace and a length in bytes. And the restriction is that any memory namespaces that are specified in these ranges have to be reachable by the compute namespace. And Bill will talk a little later about what reachability is and what that means. So you can see on the right that we have an example, kind of a contrived example, where we have two different compute namespaces and they each have a memory range set within them. And these, both of the compute namespaces refer to two different SLM namespaces. So the SLM namespaces are in purple and red in the middle. So if you look at the top one, the orange one, so that's a compute, one of the compute namespaces, it, it's created a memory range set that has two ranges. And you can see that those two ranges are for different ranges within um, SLM namespace 200, the purple one. Now if you look at the other namespace, the green one on the bottom, that one has a memory range set that has been defined to have three ranges. And you can see that two of those ranges refer to the same memory namespace as the other, which is namespace 200, and one of them uh, points to the other, other SLM namespaces, which is 210. So this is trying to illustrate that ranges can be two different memory namespaces. They can, there can be multiple ranges within the, summary, the same memory namespace. And it's also intended to illustrate that range sets in different compute namespaces can refer to the same areas in a particular memory namespace, so that is perfectly fine. Next, we have Bill, who's going to explain reachability to us. Thank you, Kim. So, as Kim mentioned, and also as uh, within what Jason talked about, you have to have some ability to restrict what namespaces are able to be used in the various commands, both the memory copy command as well as creating of memory namespaces for use in the compute command. Um, so there is another technical proposal that is part of the suite of proposals that are being done for computational storage uh, that is called reachability. So what reachability does is it defines descriptors that define what namespaces may be used in different commands for a given namespace. So what's done here is um, each namespace has, is part of a reachability group. 
And a reachability group is a group of namespaces that all have the same reachability characteristics. So in this diagram that you see, you see different associations that show what things can talk to each other. And we'll go into this, uh, the details of this particular diagram more in the next slide. But just to illustrate what's being done here is um, reachability group one in this diagram has two NVM namespaces with it, within it. What that means is those namespaces when they are associated with another reachability group have the same characteristics so that you can then have a reachability association that tells you you can reach any of the namespaces in this group. So these are used both for the copy command, for the memory copy command that is part of the subsystem local memory uh, command set, as well as the copy command that is defined in the NVM command set as it has been expanded to be able to talk across namespaces. Um, then we also have the concept of which memory namespaces may be specified in a command to a compute namespace. And in particular, the command that is used would be the uh, create memory range set command or you can also pass memory ranges actually in the execute command within the computational program's command set. And so this restricts which namespaces you can access from a compute namespace uh, in order to create memory ranges or to use memory ranges within the execute command. So the mechanism, I've kind of alluded to it a little bit, but the mechanism is we put namespaces into groups. You can have a single namespace in a group, you can have multiple namespaces in a group. Um, but then those groups are associated with other groups. And there's a couple of things here that are important to note. Having two namespaces in a group does not by itself mean that those namespaces can communicate with each other. So in particular, if you look at reachability group four in this diagram, it has two compute namespaces. Compute namespaces actually in the current definition um, have no mechanism to communicate with each other. They are in this group in order to allow them to both communicate with a variety of different namespaces, not to communicate with each other. So being in a group does not automatically mean that you can communicate with other namespaces in that group. In order to identify namespaces that can communicate with each other within a group, we have the reachability association E showing up here, which shows that the two namespaces in reachability group one, which is the only group within the namespace, can communicate with each other. Within the association, there is the ability to define characteristics of that reachability. For the copy command for the NVM command set, there is a concept of fast copy, which means copies between those namespaces are able to be performed more quickly than a read followed by a write by the host. Um, so that is called fast copy. So that would be one of the characteristics that would be asso uh, uh, associated with the reachability association. Um, so those are some of the characteristics. Um, that's the primary characteristics that is defined at the moment there's the ability to define further characteristics as we move forward. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the top level overview of reachability and how that operates. And so going into this particular uh, diagram and showing how this works. 
So reachability group A, um, which is, uh, sorry, reachability association. Uh, reachability association A, which is the yellowish one in, kind of in the center, um, it indicates that a copy is possible between the NVM namespaces and the memory namespaces in reachability group one and reachability group two. So it means that a copy is possible between NVM namespace 30 and memory namespace 10. It indicates that a copy is possible between NVM namespace 31 and memory namespace 10. It does not indicate that there is any characteristic of reachability between NVM namespace 30 and 31. So reachability group, reachability association A doesn't say anything about how the namespaces in reachability group 1 can communicate with each other. Okay, reachability association B, which is just below A, is in kind of the orange color, indicates a similar thing for memory namespace 12, that memory namespace 12 can do copies with NVM namespace 30 or NVM namespace 31. Now, the reason you don't have reachability group 3 and reachability group 2 in the same association is because in this particular example, you're not allowed to copy between memory namespace 10 and memory namespace 12. So they've had to be broken out into different groups that have different associations, and some of that also applies to the fact that they're in reachability association C and reachability association D. So they've, they've had to be broken out. So you've created more groups and not grouped some things together that maybe could have been grouped together because of their different associations that are capable. Um, reachability association C, the top right blue uh, association, indicates that compute namespace 20, which happens to be an FPGA, has uh, the ability to reach uh, memory namespace 10. What that means is that when you are addressing a command to compute namespace 20 to create a memory range set, you can create that memory range set in using memory from memory namespace 10. You cannot uh, create a memory range set in the computational namespace 20 that uses any memory in memory namespace 12. So that's how we isolate things that may be physically isolated on the device. Um, and likewise, uh, memory range association, or sorry, sorry, reachability association D is defining that the compute in namespace 22 or namespace 23 is able to utilize the memory in memory namespace 12 and only the memory in memory namespace 12. Um, finally, um, as I talked about on the previous slide, if I want the memory, uh, sorry, if I want the NVM in reachability group one to be able to communicate with each other, then there is reachability association E, which only has that group in it, and that association specifies the characteristics whereby the memory namespaces within reachability group are able to communicate with each other. A couple of other notes. Um, first off, any namespace, any single namespace, can always communicate with itself. So if I do a copy command to memory namespace 12, and I want to move data from one location in memory namespace 12 to another location in memory namespace 12, that can happen and that does not require any reachability architecture to allow that copy within a single namespace to occur. So the assumption is that a namespace always has the ability 
for anything in that namespace to communicate with anything else within that namespace. Um, the other point to make here is that the associations and the grouping, that is something that is controlled by the architecture of the device. The device reports that architecture to the host. The host does not have any mechanism to go down and change that architecture. And the reason for that is the memory in memory namespace 10 may be memory that is hard associated with the FPGA in computational namespace 20. And there's no ability for the host to go down and say, oh, I want memory namespace 10 to be accessible by compute namespace 22 because physically that's not possible. It's not how the device was architected. So there is no ability for the host to modify this map. This map is handed to the host from the device. It's handed to the host from the device by the use of log pages that the device provides back to the host. That is the uh, reachability groups log page and the reachability associations log page. Um, so um, I, I think I've already covered memory namespace 10 and 12 cannot communicate, ca cannot be used in a com copy command to each other because they're not in a, an association with each other. And I talked about the fact that the compute namespaces uh, cannot communicate with each other. There's no mechanisms for that, but they're also not in a reachability association. So that's an overview of reachability, which is a very integral part of what's necessary to make computational programs work. And with that, I'm going to hand it back over to Kim to go through some examples of a flow for uh, computational programs. Okay, so we've talked about all of the elements um, of computational storage in NVMe, so let's bring them all together with an example of how that could work. So this is a, a kind of a contrived example. Um, the idea here is to filter encrypted data. So the data is stored encrypted in an NVM namespace, and we're going to execute two different programs to first decrypt the data, and then filter the data and return the result uh, back up to the host. So there's a couple of things that have happened before the uh, sequence that's described here. Uh, first, the basic thing there is there's two memory range sets, memory range set one and two, and they have both already been created. Uh, because this slide is kind of busy and we didn't want to do all the things here. So if you look carefully, and this is a bit of an eye chart, but if you look carefully, the memory namespace 10 in the middle has a couple of shaded things on the side that say memory range set 1, which encompasses um, the first two blocks of data, and then memory range set 2, uh, which encompass the second two blocks of data. So those are the things that have been created in advance. So also in this example, we have one compute namespace, one memory namespace, and one NVM namespace involved in this flow. Uh, there is no limit of, to the number of namespaces. This just simplifies the example. So the first step in this flow um, is to copy the encrypted data that we're interested in from the MVM namespace into an, the SLM namespace. And this is done uh, using the copy command that has been described before. Uh, so now we have the same encrypted data in an SLM namespace because we need it to be there in order to operate on it by a program. Next in the flow, I think this is step two or B or very small uh, things there, B. Um, so the next thing we want to do is we want to execute uh, the program in index one, which you can see there is the decrypt program. So we want to execute that program on namespace one, 
or or basically on or in compute namespace one, I should say, and then we would have passed that uh, memory range set one to indicate that that execution is only allowed to access uh, memory described in memory range set one. So we say execute that program at, with that data. So the program executes, does the decryption, and outputs the decrypted data um, into a different place in SLM um, that was probably specified using parameters that were passed to the execute program command. The program knows how to interpret those, um, and those are just passed through. So once that is done, we send execute program success back up to the host. So the host can now say, all right, I want to execute the next program. So it issues uh, another execute program command that says to execute the program in index zero, which is our filtering program that you can see there, the blue one. To execute that um, on compute namespace one with memory, name, memory range set two. So this execution will be limited to data in memory that is described by memory range set two. So the filtering program runs. You can see our toy data is a spreadsheet that has superhero info in it. So the filtering program, uh, the filtering parameters were in this toy to filter based on um, rows that have the state equals New York. So the filtering program runs with input um, with the decrypted data, the, the one in the middle there. And the output is rows, only the rows that have the state of New York. Once that's complete, um, it sends a execute program success back up to the host. So now the host knows that that part is done. And in this example, the host wants to read the resulting data back up into host memory. Um, so that's just an example in this case. You could also leave, leave the filtered data there and operate on it with other programs or anything like that. This is just, this is just uh, what was desired in this particular example. So in order to do that, the host issues another command that says read SLM. So this is a read of the memory namespace. And in that read, it would specify uh, that it's memory namespace 10, uh, the offset to start up with the read and the length of data that it wants. So once it does that, uh, that is handled by the memory namespace and the resulting data comes back up to the host in the response. So the read SLM has succeeded and the filtered data is now on the host. So this is our example. There could be, you could just run one program. You could run many programs. You can leave data in the memory namespace for later if you want. You could also operate on data that was already in SLM. So that, that is the end of this example. Um, so this is the computational storage task group. Um, and we don't have a slide for this, but I wanted to uh, give you an update on where we are with all of these technical proposals. So at this point uh, for computational programs, uh, which is the one with the compute namespaces, uh, that one is reaching the point where it'll soon uh, go to member review, uh, which is part of uh, phase three. The subsystem local memory technical proposal, uh, it is soon to enter the ratification stage. And then there's a couple of other TPs that are necessary uh, for this. Uh, reachability is one of them. And those are close to ratification as well. So hopefully, uh, certainly this year, we'll, we'll have these things ratified. So this is the computational storage task group that uh, Bill and I are co-chairs of. Uh, 
you are very welcome. Please come and join us if you're interested in uh, defining NVMe computational storage, and in particular, what comes next. What what do we want to add on to this? Um, please come join us for that. So that concludes the slides. Are there any questions? Yeah, th thanks for the presentation. So maybe for the future work and a plan on chaining commands, that's question number one. Uh, the other thing, so from Bill, from your presentation on the reachability, it seems if you're in the same reachability group, you cannot copy between them. You, you cannot, by just being in the reachability group, you cannot copy between those two namespaces unless there is an association that only has that reachability group in it. Okay, so, so you can have, they can be in the same association, but if another reachability group is part, you cannot copy between within the same reachability group. Correct. Yeah, okay, and yeah, the other question. So, 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 Kim, did you want to talk about the possible extensions to uh, chaining of commands or JSON could or whatever? So we haven't started to um, define what chaining would look like. That is definitely something that people have expressed an interest in. Though. Um, they've ex we've had folks express interest in uh, chaining of commands, uh, defining particular downloadable programs, whether that be EPF, eBPF or something else. Um, but, you know, I definitely welcome folks, please come and help us define those things. So how to do chaining, there's a lot of devils in the details there, so um, definitely need some, some help and your help uh, defining what that would look like. So, so there are a number of things that are on the horizon. Um, most of them do not have any TPAR out there yet for them. Uh, but some of the things that were not included so we could get the initial work out the door um, were things like the ability to have subsystem local memory addressed by a host address. Um, we chose to avoid that because there's a number of security issues and other issues that have to be dealt with when you open up the subsystem local memory to be addressed using a, uh, a bar um, in PCIe, uh, but that is something that is um, in people's minds to bring in for the future. Um, come to the presentation tomorrow on uh, the SNEA um, computational storage architecture and you'll hear a little bit more about how the architecture is looking at chaining or sequencing of commands. And one of the things related to that is you can define a program within NVMe of which the program could actually contain a sequence of commands. But all of that, what programs look like is not in this revision of computational programs. Um, the other thing is, um, as Kim mentioned, the PUIDs, we are working on a process for registering NVMe uh, global PUIDs. That one is probably the farthest out, and part of it is because we don't have a good listing of what are the programs that people would like to find in that. That's a place where come get to, together with NVMe and help us define what are the global programs you would like to see NVMe support. Can you expand on the value of doing that, defining them globally? So, so the, value of, the value of defining the programs is the fact that if, um, if multiple companies, you take the three of us up here, if you take uh, Solidime and Intel and Samsung, and we all have a particular encryption algorithm that is a, the same encryption algorithm for all three of us. By defining the program unique identifier, then a user of the device can use any of our devices 
and say, oh, they have PUID in, that means it works the same way for all three implementations. It means the parameter passing is the same for all three implementations. And I know I can swap in any one of their computational program devices and expect to get the same results. How they implement it, you know, one of them may be implemented in an ASIC, another one may be implemented in an FPGA, and the third one may be implemented by a core on the computational program device. That doesn't really matter how it's implemented. The fact is, you give one input and you get one output and it is the same. So that's the value of these program unique identifiers. What's the relationship between the computational storage work in SNEA and the computational storage work in NVMe? So SNEA has defined an architecture. The architecture is intended to apply across a variety of uh, lower layer protocols, such as NVMe, the first implementation is in NVMe. Um, Again, come to tomorrow's presentation. It is going to be much shorter than this. We will be running much, much faster. However, one of the slides in that presentation will actually compare the terminology in the two and talk about how they, in essence, work together. But the SNEA work is a high-level architecture, and as we look forward to the possibility of a CXL computational storage device, that architecture will apply there just as well as it applies to NVMe. Um, SNEA has an API that is intended to be a high-level programming interface for computation that, again, you put the right library in there and it can operate over any uh, lower layer protocol. So. They've been hand in hand, as you see. I'm co-chair on both sides of the aisle there. Uh, Jason is co-chair in SNEA. Kim is co-chair in NVMe. We are working closely together to try to make certain that those two things align. Other questions? Okay, well, I thank you very much for your time. I hope this has been uh, useful for you and uh, Hope to see you uh, developing or using computational programs. Thanks. <laughs>